Well, at one time, <clears throat> there was a man who was very lonely, and one day he decided that life would be more fun and enjoyable for him if he had a pet. So he went to a pet store, and he told the owner that he wanted to buy an unusual pet. The gentleman said, how about a dog? And he said, oh, no, I don't want a dog. He says, okay, well, how about a cat? He says, no, I don't, I don't want a cat. He says, I need something around the house that can help me do things around the housework. So the fellow says, well, he says, I have a really great pet for you. He said, it's a centipede. And by the way, it's a talking centipede. So he says, that sounds great. And he took him home, and he set up a little piece, a place for the centipede to be living in, which was a little white box in his house. Then he decided that at one point that he would, take, that he would start off by taking his new pet to a restaurant to have dinner together. So he asked the centipede in the box, would you like to go to a restaurant with me to have dinner? But there was no answer from his new pet. And this bothered him. And he said, he waited a few minutes, and then he asked him again, how about going to dinner with me? But again, there was no answer from his new friend, this little pet. He waited a few more minutes and thinking about the situation, and he decided to ask him one more time. And now he put his face right up against the, the, the house where he was going to be talking to the centipede, and he shouted. And he said, hey, in there, would you like to go and have dinner with me tonight? A little voice came back out of the box from the centipede, and it said, I heard you the first time. Be patient. I'm putting on my shoes. Must have been a lot of work for the little guy to have to listen to this guy. He was getting upset with him. Well, brethren, we are living in a world today that is much fast food expressways where you can pull up to a place to eat and you have a little spot you can put your order in over the loudspeaker that they have speaking to it. And then you drive up, pick up your little meal and you can take off again. Or we have 10-minute oil changes that we can go to and have done. Where wherever we experience instant results and that are all intolerant or delay that we go through. More people, brethren, are responding with irritation or anger when not getting what they want when they want it. I remember we went to New Jersey a couple of years ago. And we got to a stoplight. We were the first car at the stoplight when it, when it was red. And we're sitting there waiting for the light to turn green. And then all of a sudden, the light turned green. And within one instant, all we heard was horns beeping behind us because they saw our North Carolina license plate. And they said, oh, how long is it going to take them for him to go with the green light? Well, businesses also are making a lot of profit from impatience that is going on. Again, jumping into same-day delivery services. Now you can just put an order in online and you'll get it delivered real quickly. But unfortunately, as the way it's going on, even though they can deliver it the same day, it probably won't be soon enough for you. Or you don't even have to go food shopping anymore. Just order online. And when you order it, just go drive down there and you go and you pick it up right at the, at the gateway there. Technology is producing impatience as well. I remember hearing years ago when I was growing up that pigeons used to carry messages. And actually, I read about it. And they, used to, they did that in the military back in World War I. And they would have pigeons take the, the information back to where they were living so they would get some help for the military at the time. So today, we can have, the way we do it, we can have a text and we can send it out or a picture even to another country within a second. There's no time to have to wait for anything. And impatient people want everything right now and they're unwilling to be waiting for anything. So we're in a process of removing all patience in every aspect of our lives every day. A lack of patience can lead to damaging decisions and it demonstrates, it demonstrates acting without the knowledge of God and leads to selfish selfish and unmerciful treatment to other people. Like everything in Satan's world today, everything gets worse and worse. And that's what's happening now with patience in our lives. I even heard that there's a church in Florida that advertises having 22-minute services. Well, that's pretty quick, pretty fast. 
And they said, go there. And they promised that in 22 minutes, it will all be over. And you'll be out of there. And the sermons are only eight minutes long. Now, don't get excited. That's in Florida, not here in South Carolina. So today, we're going to see the importance of what patience is and how we can have more of it in our lives. Brethren, let's understand that it's not man's nature to be patient. Patience is a divine attribute that God is making available. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. In verse 37, we see here that at the time here, just before Pentecost was going to be done, and Peter taught the people there that by Jesus coming and his sacrifice and death, would, had been, will be bringing on for, for people his Holy Spirit by his paying for our sins. And that Holy Spirit was going to be now made available at this time. Now in Acts chapter 2, if we go just uh, one verse back, verse 37, verse 36 rather, and he said to all the house of Israel, now assuredly that God has made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Jesus Christ. Now, verse 37, he goes on. He says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, metaphorically, that pain or that being that pricked in their hearts was a pain that reminded them sharply, especially of the emotion and sorrow that he had said that they had crucified Jesus Christ. They saw that Jesus suffered and died for our sins as well. It wasn't just those people at that time that crucified him. All of our sins had put him to death at that time. Going on in verse 38, Peter replied to them what they should do. Repent, turn from sin, and be baptized, every one of you in the name of, our, of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. So the day of Pentecost that they were celebrating at that time pictures the Feast of first fruits those that are called and chosen by God to be the bride of Christ. Now, that gift that he said there is a present given without claim or demand. God just makes a gift available to those at that time that would be there for that spirit to be made available. Acts chapter 1, let's go back there. Because as the people said, how do we do this? What are we going to do? Jesus tells us how. Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. Jesus now speaking. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put into his authority. Verse 8, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now, don't worry about these other things. Don't worry about the timeline of things or when something's going to be happening. But you will receive the power when that Spirit comes. Realize what's most important for you at that time. And you will be, in, uh, will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus told them, wait till this day of Pentecost would come and our lives would be transformed by the power that's going to be available. Now, that word power is the ability to do something, a thing having great influence, power. It's the capability, the strength, the might, and the energy. So he was telling that, that there would be power when that spirit came to them. Mankind is incomplete without God's Spirit, which gives us the power and the ability to change who we are spiritually and to take on the attributes of Christ and the Father. Now, that word holy, 
where that mentioned Holy Spirit, that word holy is hegos, and it means sacred or pure. The word spirit, the translate original is pneuma, pneuma, meaning holy wind or breath. The words reflect the power of God. How powerful, brethren, is that wind when it's blowing out on a hurricane or a tornado? Imagine how fearful it is for the people in that environment at the time when that hurricane or tornado was going on and those winds are blowing. But he's showing here that that meaning of that word has to do with wind or breath. Now, we won't turn there, but in John 20, verse 22, Jesus gave the, bre- the, the disciples that time He breathed on them his spirit. Through his breath, it came out. So it's the power that is there from that that sound or that wind coming out. So we are still living in a corrupt generation. How are we using that gift, that power that he's given us? How are we using that? Let's turn over to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and we will be reading in verse 19, where Paul here presents the works of the flesh that will prevent us from being in God's kingdom. Verse, Galatians 5, verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, Verse 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and and such like, of which I tell you as before, I told you in the past, that they which do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he's listing here all the things of human nature, all the things that man has been doing for 6,000 years on his own, when he wants to do it, why he wants to do it, whether he thinks it's enjoyable and it's not. (laughs) whether he thinks it's fun and it's really not, but it's all something that has been destroying the lives, all these things. But then he goes on in verse 22, and he lists now the gifts of the the Spirit that God is providing, the spiritual works that God makes available to us. Galatians 5, verse 22, he says, But the the fruit of the Spirit now is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. And that word there is patience gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which is self-control. Against such, there is no law. So God here is giving us guidelines and how we are to be overcoming the human nature. He's going to give us the gift, the power of this list of things that he's showing here, which is his Holy Spirit that's going to be making the changes. So Paul was listing a number of faults that we're to be removing from our character. Well, let's turn over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and we'll begin in verse 12. Colossians 3 and verse 12, Paul says here, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Clothe yourself. Make this a part of you. Take the spirit that is available, this one fruit that he says is called patience, and make it something that is a part of you inside. Verse 13, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So once we have repented and and been baptized, we now renew our way of life and use God's spirit to be like Christ. Now, the definition of patience is commonly defined as the capacity to accept or tolerate delay or trouble or suffering without getting angry or upset. Be patient when all these things may be going on. Dealing with pain or trials without complaining. So whenever we're going through these issues in our life, are we complaining Or are we being patient? Because Paul says here, these are the things that we need to be doing in order to be in his kingdom. It also means calmly tolerating a trying situation or person. Calmly doing it. Be be patient with it. Don't get too upset. Or cheer also means cheerful 
or hopeful enduring or to hold up under pressure. It's a way of thinking about and responding to the difficult circumstances in our life. A very important fruit, brethren. How many of us have been taking for granted all of our life what patience is and how important it is? Turn over to John chapter 15. Patience is what God expects from us as listed as a fruit of his spirit, which we are to be bearing in our life. John 15, let's get verse 14. John 15, verse 14. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I've learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. To bear fruit. What fruit? Fruit that will last, not fruit that's going to be just falling away. My wife and I love to have bananas every day for breakfast at breakfast time. So whenever we go to the supermarket, we always try to buy the most green bananas that are on the shelf. They have to be totally green. And we get it home, we put it on the shelf, and the next morning when we go to have it, it's yellow and brown marks on it. And thankfully, it was green the night before, so it's not quite as bad. But bananas don't last long. That's not a fruit that lasts. So you got to be careful. You want to enjoy bananas. They may not last that long. But God is, tell Paul, God is telling us here that we are to bear fruit that will last and not give up on it. And then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other that we are to be doing from Christ. Now, some characteristics of an impatient person will be, we'll talk about a little bit here, but how do we know if we are patient? How do we know if we are? Because most people deny the fact that they are impatient. Most people deny that. They don't want to say, oh, no, I'm impatient. No, everyone says they're patient. Well, one example would be, how about when someone is talking and all of a sudden they uh, cough or they clear their throat or they may be stopping to think about what they want to say or they're swallowing and all of a sudden people will jump in and start finishing what they were talking about. They even actually finished what they were, what they were speaking. They were able to hear and know what they were going to talk about. So didn't, be careful you don't stop what you're speaking. It means to quit something because we don't see immediate results. Even quit spiritually causes, will cause us to see bad results. Maybe our prayers. How about are we, our prayers? Do we have lack of patience in our prayers because we're not getting the answers for the prayers soon enough? How many times have I asked about this in my life and I'm still dealing with it? And eventually, maybe we'll stop praying because we're not getting what we want from it. And that effect, brethren, will be our re poor relationship with God and Jesus Christ. Also, we could be skipping pages with children at bedtime stories. How many parents will, at, the, at bedtime, they'll read a little story with their kids, but they'll skip through different pages and chapters so they can get it done quickly. They don't want to waste too much time. Or we become irritated or restless when others are talking too long or to do something that we don't want to be doing. Or that we complain about things that are going on that we're not happy about. Like maybe we've been in a restaurant and the waitress comes over and takes the order and we're sitting there, we're hungry, we want to eat. Didn't come yet. We'll wait a few more minutes, still didn't come. Wait even longer, and it still didn't come. Now, in about 20 minutes, we've been sitting there, and we placed this order, and, and she didn't bring it. Now, after, after the dinner is over, finally, we go to the manager and say, hey, I want to let you know that Table 75 has got a really bad waitress that doesn't take care of us when we're here. Now, do we really know what was going on at the time? Why the meal didn't come out? Maybe there was a problem in the kitchen that we didn't see, but we blame that woman or man, the waitress or waiter, that did not do what we wanted them to do. It took too long for them, so we got very impatient with it, even to condemn them later. Also, impatience is when we hold on for something uh, that we think we're holding on too long. 
I remember reading or hearing rather years ago a study about a, from a credit card company knowing that people will not hold on on a phone for more than five minutes. So whenever you would call and you would want to put something into the business or a credit card company that you're calling, and, and they'd say, please hold on. We're very busy right now. Just give us a few minutes and we'll get right back to you. And you're sitting there waiting. And after about two minutes, you hang up. And they were saying in the, in the information, the news that they're talking about it, that this, they were saying that this is why they have those time to wait. Because they don't want to be bothered with you. They're too busy. They don't want you. So they'll just say, wait five minutes. And they know you're probably going to hang up in two minutes. And they don't have to worry about you being there to bother them. So how impatient. We can't even hold on the phone. And this can be passed on to our children by not letting them proceed in their life at their own pace and what they're doing. Because sometimes we think the kids are not quick enough or they're not good enough in what they're doing. And parents often don't get satisfied on how their kids are playing sports. They get upset. Well, they didn't, they didn't catch the ball at the right. Why didn't they catch the ball? Or they didn't run fast enough around. They got nailed as they were coming in to the next stop. Are we turning the kids off in their life to think that, well, if that's how mom and dad is, then I guess I should be that way too in my life? Or how do we react whenever we're on the internet and it's getting slow? We can't get to get something to download for us. It's really annoying and it feels like it's, it's really going on. But we've years ago, it was automatically slow. 30 years ago or 20 years ago, everything was slow. But today it's gotten so fast that it's not fast enough. We want it more. So what do we do? You just call the, the company and you just pay for more megabyte speed. And now that thing will work a little faster than it did yesterday. But you just had to pay for it as well. And unfortunately, eventually, brethren, we become impatient with God because he's not answering or responding as quickly as we want it. Patience, brethren, is self-restraint, which does not quickly retaliate against wrong. When someone does us wrong, how do we respond? With patience or anger? Turn to the First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm reading this from the Amplified Version, verse 14. <clears throat> Paul says that we earnestly beseech you, brethren, admonish, meaning to warn and seriously advise those who are out of line, meaning the loafers, the disorderly, the unruly. He says, admonish them, warn them, seriously give them advice. Also encourage the timid and the faint-hearted. Help and give your support to the weak souls and be very patient with everybody, always keeping your temper having patience. Verse 15, see that none of you replies, oh, I'm sorry, see that none of you repays another with evil for evil, but always aim to show kindness and seek to do good to one another and to everyone, everybody. So here he's telling them, if, if someone is unruly or a loafer, you ought to give them advice. But if someone is timid and faint-hearted, help them, be kind, be patient with the things going on. Impatience produces a, a response of giving someone what we believe they deserve. Impatience gives them what we believe that they should deserve. And Paul was telling him here, no, this is what you should be doing for them, is to be patient with everybody and show kindness to them. Now, the Greek word there <clears throat> for, for long-suffering or patience is macrothumia, macrothumia. The word, the word, the first part, macro, means long, and thuma means anger. <clears throat> so macrothumia, it means to be taking a long time to get angry or irritated. Long suffering. It takes a long time before you'll get irritated. Once a one who is slow to avenge wrongs, to have restraint and careful thinking. When one is stirred to anger, then he patiently forbears. One who is long, has long suffering, whenever you're stirred to anger, you patiently forbear it. You hang on to it before you get over angry. One who puts up with people facing difficult situations. So remember, brethren, it's not only a feeling 
but a decision and an action that we are to be involved in. Turn over to Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 18. See an example here, a story. Matthew 18, verse 23 says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had, that payments would be made. And the, ser the servant therefore fell down before him and saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. How nice. He asked, please show me some, some patience that I can eventually pay you. Verse 28. But that same servant, he went out and found someone of his fellow workers who owed him a hundred pence. Or the word is denarius. Now, just so we know here, the first time the 10,000 talents I looked it up so many places, and it's so hard to get the exact number. But what they showed here was that was about what we would have today would be like $10 million. He had a lot of money that he owed that guy, and he was, it was, he was let go with it. But now when this guy had his, his fellow do it, he had 5000 that he had. That was what we looked at today would be like $5,000 compared to the $10 million that he had earlier. And so when he was told that, he laid his hands on him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and he begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And verse 30, and he would not, but he went and he threw him into prison till he would pay the whole debt. And when his fellow servants saw what, he had, what had been done, they were very grieved and they came and told their master all that had been done. And then the master, after he had heard, uh, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. And his master, so, uh, so should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers that he should pay all that was due to him. Verse 35, so my heavenly father here, Christ is letting us know. So my heavenly Father also will do to you, each of you from his heart, does, who does not forgive his brother the trespasses. So here we see how Christ is telling us we have to be forgiving and have to show patience with things, not to get angry and do something hurtful. So this fellow desired the master to be patient and to be long in being angry, but he did not do it himself. So patience, brethren, will encourage forgiveness. Encourage forgiveness. Turn to James chapter, oops, sorry. Okay, so the circumstances uh, before us cloud our ability to be patient with others. So the, so the things that we're going through, are they causing us to be impatient with others? Lacking patience is an indicator of our being uncaring for what others are experiencing. Again, yet God is very merciful and patient with us. Patience is a calm endurance based on a certain knowledge that God is in control. Turn to Proverbs chapter 8. <clears throat> we don't have to worry about being we don't have to worry or be impatient about how or when something will end or be resolved. We don't have to worry about that or be impatient. Proverbs 8, verse 34. It says here, Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. That word listens there means to hear intelligently, paying attention to what he says, being obedient. That word watching here, at my doors, it means being awake and staying focused on God's word. And that last point, waiting at my doorway, is being patiently seeking God's mind in the matter, waiting for him to take care of it. He will do it. Because human nature, rather, brethren, wants to be in control of everything. But we need to be developing a closer relationship 
with Jesus Christ and the Father. John chapter 15, let's look at that. John chapter 15. Whenever we have that close relationship with Jesus Christ and the Father, it helps us to begin to understand how God views patience. Because if we know how God feels about something, then we need to apply it as well. John 15, verse 5, Jesus says here, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So brethren, without God and Christ in our life, we cannot do these things. We cannot have patience. We're going to continue to live a life of impatience because we're not putting that spirit in us, having him live in us. So without him, we can do nothing. We have to study his life, his words. Impatience is a way of our life that is being out of control. Rather, rather, brethren, to live by the Beatitudes of Christ is what we have to do. The blessings that he mentioned in Matthew chapter 5, those Beatitudes, all those blessings that are there. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Peter directs us to Christ's example. <clears throat> says, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the froward or the harsh people in your life, masters that you have. Verse 19, for this is thankworthy. If a man endures pain with a clear conscience toward God, though he knows he's suffering unjustly or he suffered undeservingly. So even though you're dealing with this harsh individual and you're putting up with something and you're suffering with something, you endured pain, you suffered for it, God says he's, he's thankful for you to be doing that. Verse 20. Of course, verse, uh, the NLT version. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. Verse 21. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, re- reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. He committed himself to God. Brethren, we are, are we committing ourselves to God? and accepting the events that are going on in our life. So as Peter Peter here was telling us about these actions that we're to be doing to showing that patience, he's showing how Christ is example for us, how how we're to do it. All that he suffered, he didn't do anything wrong. And what about us? There are times that God answers quickly, and other times he makes us wait. God doesn't say when he'll respond to our requests. God is in control and he's working out our life for a purpose. There may be a lesson to be learned and God is allowing a trial for our good. Whenever we realize our weakness and look to God, he provides the help that we need. Now, David was at times very impatient waiting for God's intervention. How many times we see things that David wrote in, in, this, in the Psalms? Turn to Psalm 13. Let's look there. David at times was impatient, waiting for God's intervention, and he poured out his heart to God about his problem. Psalm 13, verse 2, in the NLT version, reads, How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day, How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Verse 3, turn and answer me, O Lord my God. The King James goes on and reads, Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Help me to see what's going on so that I don't continue to do wrong things in my life and and keep away from you. Verse 4, don't let my enemies gloat, saying, We have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. 
Verse 5, but I trust in you, unfailing, your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. So in one part here, he's, he's saying, how long do I have to go through this? But yet he's showing that he does understand who God is, and he will do it when he is ready to do it. I trust in your unfailing love. There are times when we seem to be overwhelmed with our trials. How many things, brethren, are going on? How many prayer requests are we getting from brethren that are suffering so many illnesses and problems in their lives? Or their children suffering, going through horrific issues with surgeries of different things? So we may be overwhelmed with our trials, and then we think, I can't take it anymore. This is enough. Why doesn't God end this? But as David showed us, he looked beyond the problem. He was at a low point at times, yet he came to see that God was there for him. Let's turn over now to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, we'll see another example of someone who had been mentioned to us who had patience as well. James chapter 5, and we'll begin in verse 10. James 5 and verse 10. <clears throat> so take, take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. He says, and you've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So here we're told that there are examples of suffering and affliction with patience. So no matter what we're dealing with, brethren, we have to have that patience. Now, God had said about Job that he was a perfect and an upright man. Yet God allowed Satan to put him through severe trials, losing his livestock, losing his children, his physical condition with sores and boils from the head to the toe. It was so severe that even his wife told him to curse God and die, which he rejected in doing. Plus, his friends that were there to supposedly help him were not helpful and frustrating him. But his patience was so was to trust that God would give him an answer, allowing him to come to the point of seeing what was it that God wanted him to be seeing and understand finally who God was. All that time, he didn't know. But God wanted him to wait it out, and he had the patience to get through that. It was something that he needed to see that God ultimately allowed it to happen for him. And he blessed him after that with more children, with more animals, that he was now healthy again in his physical life. Everything was back to normal again because God was now blessing him with his patience. Another element of patience his patience is the fruit of God that enables a man or a woman to remain steadfast under strain and continue pr pr uh, pressing on by faith. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul says here, uh, sorry, Paul and Silvanus and Tim Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is, as it is good, because that your faith grows exceedingly and the charity of every one of you, of uh, every one of you all toward each other abounds so that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God. Notice, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So all that you've been going through, all the suffering that you've had, the persecutions that you've been going through, now he says you're showing that patience, that patience in your lives and that faith that they had at the time as well. So their patience here, he's saying, was an example to the, for the other churches that would be seeing this as well. In spite of their problems and their trials, they had the patience and faith to endure. So how can we become more patient? Point number one is to always keep our mind on the goal. Always keep our mind on the goal. 
Romans chapter 8 and verse 22. Let's read there. Romans 8, verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as well, eagerly for, the adoption, for our adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he... he who hopes for what he has already? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So it's showing here, even though there are things in our lives that we're groaning and having trouble with, he says, make sure that we have hope for what God will be providing for us and that we wait for it patiently. So we need to have vision to be focused on the end result, not the time right now that we are that we believe should be happening. So patience is a positive response connecting with hope. Now, if we're not focused on the goal, we'll begin to worry about how things will turn out. If we, if we get off the goal of the, what God has said should be done, we will become overwhelmed in having to wait for things, and we lose hope and motivation. We get nervous. We get impatient when we don't see it coming quickly. The Bible has warned has warnings for us to be sure that we're following the correct path that God has for us. Let's turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 10. Impatience, brethren, will tend to have us take matters into our own hands when we don't focus on the goal. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Now, in, in the book of Samuel, uh, chapter 10, Samuel, Samuel was telling Saul what was to be going on, and he was to be going away for a while, and he was told Saul to be waiting. 1 Samuel 10, verse 8, he said, You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should be doing. So now he told him what his responsibility was and what his goal was to do. Sit here, wait until Samuel comes back to make the offering before God, before anything else would happen that would be a battle of some kind. In other words, don't worry if there's going to be any problem here. He said, just wait here until he comes back. Dropping down of, uh, sorry, chapter 13. Let's go move up there a little bit. 1 Samuel 13, verse 8. Now it says he waited seven days, and the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's men now became uh, scattered. They were scattering themselves. So he said, bring me a burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering before God. Verse 10, just as he had finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. And Samuel says, what have you done? Saul replied, Oh, when I saw the men that were scattering, and you did not come at the set time, and then the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. Meaning, he didn't look for God's help at the time. He says, so I forced myself to offer a burnt offering. Now, isn't it amazing that he could say something like that? He says, I forced myself to do something that wasn't supposed to be done. How many times have we justified something that we did in our life by saying, I had to force myself to do that, to respond in the way maybe that I did to other people? I had to force myself to do that. Verse 13, he says, you acted foolishly. Samuel said, you have not kept the command of the Lord your God, that your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel all time. But now your kingdom will not endure, because the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him a leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. So the kingdom now was removed from Saul and given to David. If only he had waited a while. If only he had been patient and waited, he, Saul was, uh, Samuel was saying, this would not have happened. You would have had the kingdom. Well, we don't know what God would have done afterwards, but... This is what he had set him to do. That was his purpose. 
So Saul lost his focus on what his goal was to wait and choose to do it rather his own way. How about us? Are we choosing to do everything our way? Are we choosing not to wait for God's hand in our life with whatever we're going through, whether it's a trial or temptation or habit or a problem that we have been dealing with? We have, been, we have a warning from Christ to the church of Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. You don't have to turn there if you don't want, but Revelation 3 and verse 10. Because you have, to the church of Philadelphia, because you have kept my command to be patient, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come on the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I, I am come quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one may take your crown. Hold on to that goal that you have. Understand what your purpose is to be doing and have the patience to wait and do what he says to keep his command. The second point we are to do is to be act on, in, avoid acting on impulse or emotion. Impulse is a sudden, strong urge or desire to act. An emotion is a strong feeling of fear. Psalm 37, let's turn there. Psalm 37, verse 7. Psalm 37, verse 7. It says here, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his ways, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Don't fret because of these negative things that are happening. Rest in the, in the Lord and wait patiently on him. Verse 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Don't fret or don't lose your temper because it will only cause harm. So this is not cheerful waiting. It's not cheerful waiting. That word fret means anger, like a kindling fire. Anger will tear away at patience. It will destroy our patience. Anger to ourselves for slow pace of growth and change. We're angry because I'm not doing what I should have been doing. I'm not doing as good of a job as, as what I should have been right now in my life. All these years, God has been working with me. What am I doing? Outbursts of angers to others as well who are slow is very negative and will tear away at those people. Verse 9, he goes on and says, For evildoers shall, shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, those who have patience on God, they shall inherit the earth. We will inherit the world, brethren. Patience is a fruit of faith, and we are to be trusting in God. So what lesson is God teaching me by having to wait? Do we get sucked into being impatient and act irrationally and go along, and go along with others who follow their emotions and impulses? We get sucked in with other people who have no patience, and what they're saying sounds okay, so I become, I'll feel that way about them too. I'll be negative about things. Patience is the ability to accept delay, Disappointment. How do we do handle delay or disappointment? By accepting it without becoming upset. Accept it without being upset. James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And verse 7. James says here, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early, uh, the early and latter rain. So he's showing here that the farmer waits patiently because he understands what he is waiting for and how it's going to be coming along because it's going to receive early and latter rain. Not all going to be coming, you know, on a sunny, happy day like that. He knows that the harvest will come at the end of the season, as the farmer will know that as well. We have a reason and an understanding to wait for God's mercy. Verse 8, he goes on and says, You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble or murmur or complain against one another. Brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. 
Complaining, brethren, means it's not happening fast enough or how I expect it to happen. And we are right now in our day of judgment, brethren. How are we using God's fruit in our life as we're being judged? How do we respond to the trials? Is it based on our faith? And is that faith based on God's promises? How do we respond to the trials? Through his faith. Point number three, we are to change our attitude of how we look at life. How do we look at life? James chapter 1 and verse 2. We heard a little bit of this earlier. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brother, encounter all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That word there, joy, brethren, Going through a trial will strengthen our faith. That's what he's saying. Count it joy when you go through a trial because that trial is testing your faith and it's going to produce patience. So we are to realize we're going to be going through trials. It's not that we're bad or we're evil before God. There are things we have to be going through that he wants us to learn something from it. Now that word patience here is who Hupamoni, hupamon, and it means cheerful or hopeful endurance, to endure cheerfully. Psalm chapter 40, let's turn there. We must be thankful for the opportunity to develop patience, which is Christ's character. Psalm 40 in verse 1. Again, David says, I waited patiently for the Lord, he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of this, a, slim, a slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Verse 4. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. So we are to wait patiently for the Lord because he will hear our cry and our prayer. And he positively saw that he put a new song in his mouth. He put new thoughts in his mind that were going to be positive and not negative. So blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. And we don't look to the proud or those who look to false gods. Impatience, brethren, reflects our lifestyle which unfortunately is the fastest way of our living our life. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 28. says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable, he gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. He gives power. He gives his spirit to the weak so that they will have the ability to increase strength. Verse 30, even the youths shall faint and be weary, and so, and the young men shall utterly fall. Verse 31, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Those who have patience on God and wait will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We won't collapse in our life because we are impatient, because we're not getting things the way we want it. Patience is not a feeling. It is a gift from God. It's a fruit of his spirit. Patience is a willingness to wait upon God and his will. Patience is grown by faith in God working in and through us to salvation. We have a choice, brethren, to be patient or not. It's our choice. We need to slow down and see what is God doing in our life. What are the lessons that we are to be learning? Patience, brethren, is something that we have to exercise and grow in. 
It's not what human nature is comfortable with. We have to change this. That's why he's given it as one of the the fruit of the spirit that he has available. It's something that man cannot find. He has to make it available for us. Are we taking advantage of that gift and using it? Turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10. Read this in the NLT version, verse 32, Hebrews 10. He says, think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Brother, when you think back when we first came in the church, how many times did things happen that were hard? Some brethren who lost jobs because of now keeping the Sabbath or had family issues because they were not now keeping Christmas or Easter or not able to eat unclean foods anymore. Now all these different things that were going on, yet we were zealous and faithful. The zeal that we had, for, brethren, when we first came to the truth of God and had our eyes and ears open to see what that was all about was so exciting, even though there were those things happening that were negative in our life. Verse 33, he goes on, sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and you were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. Verse 34, you suffered along with those who were thrown in jail, and when you all and when you own and what and all you owned was taken from you. Accepted it, accept it with joy. Did we accept it with joy when all that was happening that was negative at the time? He says, you, you knew you were there for better things waiting for you that it will last forever. We knew, the, we knew the, the goal that was coming. We knew the purpose of why we were here. We weren't going to let it destroy us. Verse 35, so do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great <clears throat> reward that it brings you. Verse 36, patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. The promises he made, brethren, is there for us. We've got our part to do. We've got to cooperate. We've got to be committed to God. And we've got to follow his word to do those things and to continue to do his will. Verse 37. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith but I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. Means whoever quits or drops his crown or who lacks patience. Got to be careful. There are definitely bad consequences to the sins that we are participating in our life. Verse 39, but we, but we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. There's the joy, brethren. There's the happiness to know that we will be saved if we are following his will and his word and keeping his commandments and especially using those powerful uh, spirit that he has given us to make the changes in our life and not just patience, but all of them that he listed for us there that are so important. So let's remember these three things that we looked at. Number one, keep your eyes on the goal and being to be in the kingdom of God. Number two, avoid acting on impulse or emotion to be careful we don't become angry, but we are patient in things. Number three, change our outlook on life and trust in the Lord. Let's turn to one last verse here today. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians 3, reading is in the NLT. It says here, May the Lord lead your hearts unto full understanding an expression of the love of God and the patient endurance that comes from Christ. Brethren, we make sure that we hear today the importance of having God lead our hearts to understanding the importance of keeping his will and his law, that we will be in the kingdom of God, that we will be the bride of Christ when he returns. <laughs> 